we don't really hear the struggles they have and I think it's our job to really bring all those unheard perspectives and put it in and uh, help the viewer make sense of all the information that's out there. Yeah, so, but it really depends on the genre and the type of film you're making and if it's a protagonist-driven show, it's very different from a very factual um, uh, kind of documentary. Okay, that's a nice uh, question. Okay, my second um, kind of um, question is actually is a bit of an elephant in, in the room. And um, I'll declare my hand as a, a Western libertarian, you know, and, um, and of course the West has enormous amounts of libertarian issues, but Singapore has a special relationship with censorship. And, um, you know, I, I was looking at the reports of our borders um, yearly index, uh, for world press freedom. And, um, you know, Finland is number one, UK comes in 38, America 41, Indonesia's is rankings of 180 countries, but Indonesia's 130, Philippines 138, Malaysia 146, Russia 148, How many countries are there? 200, uh, <laughs> Singapore is 154. So, um, they, they give a little rationale uh, for this um, placing. Uh, the NDA um, Media Development Authority um, um, censors journalistic content. Um, the government agency has ordered <coughs> um, closure of the Real Singapore news website. Um, uh, two of the contrib contributors were accused of sedition, and there is a uh, um, regular currency. Is there democracy in Singapore? Is well, that what you're asking? Well, my question is, is as journalists, how do you feel? Do you agree that there's a problem? And, and I'm, I'm, but what I'm interested in are the mechanisms of censorship. Because, um, you know, is it essentially uh, self censorship within Media Corp? Or um, is there some voting man, some mysterious man? Okay. So I think it's a bit of everything. Over time, we've evolved. I mean, I, I studied overseas, I came back with this idealism. How can Singapore democracy be this way? How can we do things like that? And then I realized things work a certain way here for certain reasons. Singapore is very unique in that respect. We are not, the media is not the, the third, you know, is not the watchdog there to, to pounce on politicians and, and, and not, you know, to, to hold people accountable. That's not our role here. I think our role really is to, to sort of disseminate information to help people understand what is happening out there. Yes, do we do we uh, do we do propaganda? We do. Propaganda is not a bad word actually. The negative connotation is something we give to it. But propaganda just means getting information out there, letting you know what's happening. A lot of times we do support the government in getting the word out. Uh, do we have the right to challenge the government? Yes, we do. Do we want to air it out here all the time? No. A lot of times we have these discussions, maybe behind closed doors. We do talk to our politicians, we say, have you thought about this, about that? They do listen. <coughs> we have discussions. They have a lot of discussions in Parliament, and many views are shared, but very often they're not shared with everyone, so you don't have to see all of it. So it seems that we don't have that sense of freedom. Sure, could we have more freedom? Yeah, but you want to be like the US? I mean, I'm sorry, but that is just the other extreme of end of the stick, you know? So it's different for every country. We cannot take one measurement that is used in another country and apply it to this country and say, how come you're not like that? So I think you, Singapore is unique that way. In terms of the rankings, you can be, well, I'm a bit skeptical. Any survey can say you are one or 10, depending on the criteria of measurement, what they use to measure. So university, where do you stand? In, in, I've just been told in one survey, NUS is higher ranked than Yale. Yeah, what's the criteria for measurement? I don't know. But, so it depends on which one you want to subscribe to, you can say, you know, just like radio stations, Class 95 is the number one English station in the country. Again, yes, KISS 92 also makes that claim, depending on which age group, which demographic, at what peak hour, blah, 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 blah. blah. So I, I, I did come back and think, yes, we feel very restricted, but actually, for me, in my opinion, a lot of the things that happen are, are fine because within the things that Singapore bans and doesn't allow and are things which generally most of us don't want. They have this, we have this white picket fence, yeah, but generally what's outside is what most of us don't want anyway. Could we have more freedom? Yeah, but is it really necessary? 
I don't know. I'm kind of cool with it. So, what do you guys think? <laughs> I think when talking about censorship, it's also important to think about whether the people who are creating the content really feel uh, censored. And as a young journalist, I can say that, you know, with a lot of information, I have never felt the censorship. And I've been able to produce a lot of content that I've been wanting to produce. But also, it's related to the fact that I don't want to, as he said, I don't want to be the watchdog of politicians. I have no interest in that. And a lot of my colleagues in the newsroom also don't pursue stories like that. So I think, in part, I think it's also got to do with the culture of the media in Singapore. For some reason, there just isn't that, you know, that desire to want to do that sort of reporting. Um, Maybe she has a different I, uh... <laughs> uh, I have many experiences with censorship and I would say there is definitely censorship in our media and uh, I went through, in a way, a long struggle with it before I, I came to terms with the way things are run. So I had a very different experience from Shu Shen. Um, and uh, I remember when I first started, I was like, I was pretty idealistic and there were a lot of stories I wanted to cover. And there was there was one critical point where I, I just broke down and I cried and I, I felt like that was the point, even though <laughs> that was the point I kind of lost trust in the profession. Um, it was a it was a foreign worker story and I remember the foreign worker was telling me you know, um, she, she said you know sister you need to get this story out because uh, it's very important and blah 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 and that story was heavily censored and a lot of um, experts sound like were taken out. And I was very, very sad. Yes, of course. I think. And I mean, I have. So there's, there's a lot more to that. So um, that was that was one that was one of the bigger cases. And there were other issues, you know, with taxi driver stories. Um, uh, for example, I I interviewed this woman, a uh, female taxi driver, and then she. She cried when I interviewed her, talking about her experience driving and how she was being mistreated by passengers and stuff. And the part where she was crying was taken out because somebody said, you know, we shouldn't put that in because first of all, she's female and she's not representative of taxi drivers in Singapore. And second, it's going to reinforce stereotypes about female taxi drivers and they are weak and they are this and that, which I didn't agree with. And this, this argument about how it reinforces stereotypes came up a few times. Um, in other areas as well. And in, in my opinion, I feel that as journalists, it's our job to put it out there. And if and of course, it would for some people, it would reinforce stereotypes, but for, for others, it might bring in a new perspective and allow them to see something they never considered before. And of course, we can't con control you know, people's reactions. There will, be, there will always be pe people who will choose to hold on to their stereotypes. Um, yeah, and... Uh, and when you talk about self-censorship, yes, that happens as well because after a while, I kind of got tired of uh, fighting with my bosses about what should go in and what shouldn't and I, it was very, very tiring and I, I didn't, after a while, I really didn't want to do any story that I felt would not be covered well because of censorship and I avoided those topics if I knew they were going to be problematic because I felt it, 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 it wouldn't do, do justice to the story. So I started to... Um, I, I chose stories that I felt would be covered well because I feel that as a journalist I have a responsibility that was given to me by you know the people who have shared their stories to me and it you know it takes trust they are telling me sometimes very intimate stories and and they trusted a stranger with 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 a story and I felt that I needed to give justice to it so sometimes I when uh, I know that it's yeah. going to be problematic it's not going to pass through I would rather not. Let's Let me just add on to that. I think Vivian's brought a very good point. I mean, sure, we all have times when we've come across stories that we really wanted to do and we felt that it wasn't uh, portrayed the way we, we felt it should be. Uh, I'm not saying taking either side, but you also have to take consideration. Sometimes the boss at the time may be thinking, we need a balanced story. We can't set up stories that only show one side of the coin. So we have to bear that in mind. And sometimes we avoid using very emotional content because it, it does sway people in a certain direction. I'm not saying, I don't know the entire scenario, the context of it, all those things, maybe at that time, something had just happened in the country. So it's bearing in mind, sometimes, you may not see it, but 
what's happened in the country, the national agenda, also plays a part in what is coming out. Is that censorship? Yeah, it is. Is it right? Is it wrong? I don't know. Is it appropriate for the time? Maybe, maybe not. If I had showed that and it caused a riot somewhere, should I still have showed that clip? Or should I have not showed that clip? And that's a totally different debate because it takes censorship to a different level. So Singapore's unique in the sense again because we're so small. So, so many things are controlled very tightly. And I think for good reason. Whether it's good or bad, I, I can't tell you what it is. Does someone call up and say, take that off air? Sometimes it does. And believe it or not, it may not be a politician. It can just be a viewer saying, I felt very offended by that. So it can be any of you calling to react to any of this. It doesn't have to be somebody up there. There is no somebody. There are many somebodies. <laughs> and is there self-censorship? Yes. I think we all do that as well. So, uh, yeah. Okay, we will. I mean, we can and, go. Uh, and, uh, I, and I just want to put in a caveat. It doesn't mean that we are we are just being very safe because we do do stories like recently I did this documentary called Regardless of Race which for me was really really towing the line about what we can talk about and that's for me a big step forward and a lot of people may criticize it and say you know we're still not talking about XYZ but the fact that the documentary got out in the first place which you know half the time we're wondering whether it would even go on air that for me was a, a big step forward and I think we are always, you know, within the organization doing doing our best to to toe the line and 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 yeah. Of course, like it's inspiring. It's easy when you put this out um, internationally. Um, again, and America, it's a, I mean, America. What is the read about it? The New Yorker, for instance, said. Those of us who are in the fourth estate have a duty to spread the word of his ridiculous charges. Um, people like Amos E, if they end up the custodians of our profession, the futures of countries like Singapore can be brighter than their past. Um, Seriously? Well, that, Donald Trump. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, but. No, no, that is, that is absolutely a fair uh, observation. Um, but, but my main problem is with censorship is actually its effect on creative output. Because what I see is uh, budding young uh, students who, who want to be filmmakers and writers, and this culture of self censorship and <coughs> ultimately censorship of, of their final works um, really puts a dampener on, on uh, the creativity. And quite recently, this whole debate is an art thing possible in Singapore. And for me, we don't have to be censorship is the biggest. Well, we, we can't answer on behalf of the government, so I think there's no point, you know, I mean, we won't, we won't, uh, what we do is what we do, and I think it's within different boundaries. The arts is also quite a different field from the media, so I think we, it's not, we can't bundle it all together. Why don't we take some questions from you guys? I have something to say to that. I yeah. think that, uh, create, I think that censorship should not be an, an excuse to having no creativity. In fact, censorship being there is an impetus for us to get creative in telling the story in a different way, in a way that is sensitive, that wouldn't get people so offended and um, still get the message out and get people thinking and get, uh, yeah. So, and it's the same thing, you know, if you look at media, even if it's not censored, so many stories out there have been done, you know, there's so many media organizations worldwide and now everybody can be a journalist because there's citizen journalism and all that. And we're competing, you know, against so many people for stories and it's really about how do you get creative to make sure your story is told in a different way, in a way that gets people attention. So I don't think that censorship is necessarily a barrier to creativity. In fact, it forces us to think, given that this censorship law is there, how can we go around it? <coughs> All right, it is there to be a I'm not going to ask about I'm Kun K1, I'm the director of strategic planning and university. I'm also the director of the Economy Center for the Uh Actually, I, I, mean, I really want to focus more on the view of journalists because I think one of the things that you have to do is keep a very close view on the house of the ground. Either because you want to bring up different perspectives, either you want to bring a national agenda, or because you think it's an interesting question for me to answer, I hope. So maybe my question to you is how do you keep your sense of what is important that needs to be brought out in the open and for which the media is the appropriate channel to get that out? Uh, 
in a sense, you're asking how, how do we keep abreast of what's really happening on the ground, right? I mean, yeah, how do we decide? <laughs> what should be discussed? Because you have a, you have a, yeah. you have a mass uh, communication channel. So you have access to something that the rest of us, we can just talk about, but we're not going to have access to that channel. Well, the coffee shop talk also happens in the office. <laughs> so, I mean, we'll have team meetings and we'll throw up all the ideas, look at the issues that are out there. Very often, we're reacting to what has kind of already happened, you know, and what people are talking about in the street. And then there's a need to, to further investigate the issue, to clarify and to find out what are the actual facts. Um, we don't do a lot of crystal ball gazing. I mean, we know certain key events are coming up ahead, but we won't plan and say, I think something might come out of that. Let's work on that. I mean, sure, other things like Olympics and things like that, you, you will, other big events, but on a day-to-day -day issue, I think, for example, the show Talking Point, I do, is very much about what's happening on the ground. But uh, we have no special method. I mean, a lot of times it's just from what we each are reading in different platforms, online, papers, and we hear that, yeah, there's a, a question of special needs which we feel is not addressed enough. There's not enough awareness on that. Then we may decide as a team to work on that. We did another one about dementia. We've had other topics about like preparing for death. Things which people talk about but not quite talk about. So there's no there's no formula in terms of how we decide what comes up. That's the current affairs. The news is really just reacting to whatever is happening on that day itself. So. Another question? what's happening in the US, we have our correspondents there, we kind of report on just what is happening. There is no uh, personal input required. When you have an interview with a guest, I mean, we just kind of ask questions that we think everybody else would be wanting to ask. How I feel about Donald Trump, I mean, for example, doesn't play into the scheme of things. It shouldn't. If you can tell that I'm not for him, then, then I haven't been doing my job effectively. But the same token, I think we are all as I mentioned earlier, we're never fully, truly neutral and objective because we all have some biases. And uh, that's why there are commentaries. Commentaries are basically for you to air your opinion as whoever, you know. I mean, that's why we always hear about, in the Straits Times, about, I don't even forgot her name, but she tells us about her, her whole love life and her Sumiko Tan, yeah. You know, that's, <laughs> which is a totally different kind of news that I'm not reporting. But yeah, so that that's for, for news. You want to talk about it? Oh, sorry. I guess taking it back to a more local issue, if we look at how we reported the general election last year, um, I think in the digital team at least, there was a lot of effort to ensure that we gave equal coverage to all parties, not just the PAP. And it was actually a KPI, or not, not even a KPI, it was a necessity <coughs> to generate reports on how many posts we had for each party and to make sure that it correlated to the size of the party. So, you know, that we take measures, we actually do take measures like that. In terms of writing commentaries on, you know, our own opinions about the different parties, what? What's all this chapter about? <laughs> but do you think there's democracy in Singapore? Do we think there's democracy in Singapore? Yeah. Let, why don't we let all of you answer? What do you all think? Is yeah. democracy in Singapore? Are we a democratic society based on justice? Are they? 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 Who says yes? Who says no? 
<laughs> I mean, and that's why, as she mentioned, we make a conscious effort to cover both sides because that is the exact sentiment out there that will say it's been unfair. It's interesting. Yeah. I prefer just defense of propaganda. And propaganda can be done beautifully, it's an art. <laughs> um, and isn't it, isn't it just best to own it? You know, to, to say that it's manipulation and bias, we do it well. <laughs> But we don't, so you, you feel that it's biased. Yes. Yeah. But we don't feel that it's biased. <laughs> so that, that's where we differ. That's what we got. I'm sure um, that's right. Well, I think there are measures put in place, especially when it's covering yeah, things like local elections, you know, giving equal airtime and all that. But um, so I've heard a story, this was, I didn't encounter it personally, but my colleague who was preparing those dossiers or like, uh, I think presidential election or something when the candidates are announced they have to prepare like a, uh, some sort of maybe one minute to introduce you know to viewers who are these candidates and then my friend was, my colleague was telling me that you know one candidate said it like two weeks in advance because we would, we would write to them and say hey give us we need this information you know for blah 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 and then the other candidate gave us like the day before and obviously we have less time to prepare for the candidate that gave us the day before and it may look a bit more slipshod partly because we have less time so uh, there are there are little factors like that sometimes it's kind of beyond our control but i think there are measures we put in place to try to be balanced but uh, to your point answering your question about whether it can be objective i think you should never ex expect any media organization to be objective and Channel News Asia, our branding is, is Channel News Asia. It's giving the Asian perspective. So when it comes to US election, our stories are, are planned and intentionally meant to look a bit different from if you watch a US coverage or a UK coverage because when we are briefed to get a story about the US election, we are looking at you know what is its impact on Asia, what is US and uh, Japan's bilateral uh, relations, how is it going to change if Trump takes over and what impact does that have on our security here. So it's going to be a different focus and in that sense it's biased. We are we're giving you a perspective already and all media organizations does that depending on how it's funded, um, you know, where its money is coming from. So uh, I mean as a viewer I think you should be cognizant of that. You should look at where a media organization is getting its money and you should always be reading from a variety of uh, a healthy diet of news, I would say. That's right. It's very, it's very clear the difference between CNN and Fox News, right? You know the difference, right? Each of them are for different parties. So if you watch it knowing that, you have that no therapy. But let's talk about uh, fabrication. Have you, ever been, have you ever been tempted to make up something? So, um, when we <coughs> look at a documentary, it's a very... It's something that requires a lot of investment in, ter in terms of time, commitment, research, and money. So before we would even go in, it's, it's quite unlikely that we would have filmed for six months and have nothing because if we knew that there were nothing, we would have pulled it off at two weeks, for example, or one week. In fact, for the Don't Care Round show where it's a six months project, we were filming over six months, we did a pilot like a one week. We just spend one week there, no crew, no equipment, the reporters, we just plan ourselves there, observe the classroom, look at the kids, get to know them for one week and, and decide, you know, okay, you know, could there be a potential story here? Who are the outstanding characters that we can follow? So these are the ways we, uh, I guess, measures we put in to minimize the risk of investing so much and then having nothing coming out of it. Um, I think there have been cases where we have put in money and we threw away an entire story. Uh, even for like Get Real, we paid for the research and stuff and we realized we can't get access. And when there's no access, there's no story because you, you, there's nobody fronting the show, you know. So we have done that before. As for fabrication, I have never... We have never fabricated out of nothing. There needs to be something, <laughs> you know. So, like, for Don't Kid Around, we filmed over six months, and when you look at one episode, it looks like a ton of things happened in a half-an-hour show, but it's, like, 
something, a scene that happened on a Monday in January and we put it together with a scene that happened in May and we put it together in the same episode and it looks like a ton of things happen and the lives of the kids are very exciting but actually it, it all happened over six months and, it, and it's condensed. Yeah, but it, we don't really, we can't fabricate out of nothing because you need... We, we, we won't, we, we don't. We will just throw it away and not make the show. We, we won't. I mean, the, well, there was one case of a news agency overseas being caught up because they said, well, I'm reporting to you, you know, from the scene of this disaster, and, da, 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 da. and then they realized that they were just in the car park of their building, you know, kind of, it was faked and just to, to do that. So they got caught. So then, 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 then you're in trouble because nobody will ever believe anything you do again. Anyway. Yeah. And it's really hard to fabricate, I have to say, when we, are, when we are deciding which story to do, when we are pitching stories and researching and before we decide to go in, let's say, to a, a different country to report, there's a lot of considerations and it just makes my job easier if I have all the profiles, the experts I need and the characters. It's so difficult to fabricate, we, we usually don't go there. Another not just thinking about censorship, not just as there's a frozen man or somebody behind a curtain telling you guys what to do, or self-censorship. I think we have to think about creativity in a, in a larger context, so socially within, say, this country. Um, it's, it strikes me that perhaps there might be other forces or pressures um, at work. So for example, our, our students, uh, young men and young women who may be interested in pursuing careers in, in broadcasting, for example, or the media. I, I don't know if there's, there's the, or do you guys feel from your own experience as a social space for people to, to pursue that line, right? Or did you feel discouraged, for example, socially from your family or in education institutions or whatever to kind of pursue other careers that may, may have um, prevented, so for example, some creative individuals from entering the, the, the field from the very beginning? Just talk about your own kind of. Did you? Did you want? Were you supposed to be a lawyer or a doctor? Or <laughs> yeah. I think all of us were, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's definitely not as glamorous as you know being in a top law firm or being in a top finance firm. <laughs> I mean, most of the time I'm carrying my own camera, just you know, like in a really unglamorous place, looking really unglamorous, but. Uh, no, I never really felt uh, inferior to someone else who decided to pursue a different career path. I think it's also about managing your own expectations, right? You can't expect to go into the media and expect to be earning like a lot of money and, and looking really glamorous. It's a, it's a lifestyle choice, really. But having said that, a lot of my friends who have those kinds of jobs envy what I do. <laughs> I think that uh, it's not so much the censorship that discourages people from coming in, although people may drop off along the way, like they work for a few years and they quit if they get like disgruntled. But I think when people are coming in, probably one of the bigger barriers is the money, I think, because across the industry, it doesn't pay very well. So pretty much the only people who stay in the industry are people who love their jobs. <laughs> and because it's very long hours, uh, it's, it's not an easy, cushy job. Yeah, so I think in that sense it attracts the right people because the people who are there are there <laughs> because they they just want to do the job and, and uh, are willing to take shit pay for that. It's not. Okay, let me. I'm, I'm the oldest of the lot here. You know? <laughs> I've been with uh, Mediacorp for about slightly over 11 years now. Um, I didn't choose journalism, I kind of fell into it. So my background is as a media. Media guy, I worked my first job with an ESPN, you know, and then I went to work with different media companies, producing, and then presenting kind of came by the way because one day I was working on another show and my producer friend was auditioning people for a new show. He said, hey, come on, I need 10 guys to audition. You just, you want that? So I get my, make, make up my quota. So I did, and I got the job. So that was kind of a, a fun thing. But coming into journalism, what I really like about it is that every day is different. I think we meet a lot of different people. Every week the shows look at different issues, so you learn a lot. 
you learn a lot, you discover a lot about different things happening. There's a, a real wide wealth of knowledge. Where I like to say I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. And every day is different. You don't get stuck behind your desk doing the same thing over and over again. Sure, it has its challenges. I mean, yes, pay is not great because it's a small market industry, small. Never mind, just marry someone who's richer. <laughs> Problem solved. You know, so you can keep on doing it. I mean, it's, it's a bit, I wouldn't classify it, you want to be an arts, an actor, a filmmaker. I think it's a little bit more challenging. I think if you're working, we're still seen as traditional media, so you still have a, a stable job. It's still there day to day. You still get a paycheck every month. You know, you can still survive on it. You won't be, in the US, uh, you, the news anchors, it's crazy. I mean, some of them earn like, you know, five, ten million dollars a year. It would never happen here in Singapore. I'll make it very clear. Even our more senior guys are nowhere near earning even half a million dollars, okay? So, so if you are looking for a get rich story, then marry someone else. Thanks. Um, can I pay you guys a compliment? That um, in Asia, it looks very professional. I mean, for that, okay, it's not the same budget as CNN, but you guys look good. You really do. Thank you. Um, and um, on the other hand, <coughs> the media called um, drama production um, from what I've seen, but trying to be diplomatic, that it has first started, <laughs> it certainly doesn't look high budget at all. It, it, there seems to be a lack of, of quality, that's the problem. And why is this in Singapore? I come back to my question. Because comparatively, you look at Hong Kong or similar sized nations in Europe, have you know export drama all over the world, they have massive kind of quality productions. Why why is it not here in Singapore? But well, we could. I mean the money is there. I don't think we can answer that. None of us are from the drama side and <laughs> to be honest, I am not familiar with the market there or how the industry but works. So. Money that is allocated guys more to the guys to the drama. No, I think they're very different mediums. I mean, drama is, you're making an entirely fictional show. With news, we're telling you as it is. I film a scene here as it is. I don't have to make it look nice. For a TV production, you have to make it look nice. And I think there's a lot more to it, you know. So as you would know, so I, I think we can't compare the two. They're entirely different. But then the global question is, why is there not the investment in media that there is in, say, like Hong Kong? Or maybe that is, but the market is different, I guess. I, I don't know how much it goes into drama. Um, news is a different budget as well, and I think that's driven more by sponsorship and revenue from advertising. Hong Kong movies travel all over the world. Uh, I've only seen a Singapore show, one of our Chinese shows get dubbed in India, I think. So I've seen those. <laughs> so, sorry, I, I don't think we can answer that for you. Any other questions? sitting in between two yeah. TV people, so I'm trying to be as diplomatic as I can. Um, I, don't, I think when we first started out um, reversioning content for CNA Insider, I think naturally there was that sort of resistance from some TV producers because they were afraid that we would steal the eyeballs. Um, so yeah, there was a bit of, you know, being a bit protective of your own content, but I think having worked with them for a few months and getting them to understand the importance of you know, um, extending your content across different platforms has paid off because, um, you know, they end up seeing the results. Millions of people get to see the clips if, when they, if and when they go viral. Um, so I think that's a problem that is being resolved. In terms of monetization, I can't comment on that because that's not, you know, my job and I don't really understand the mecha mechanics of that either. But I'll let... I can tell you that yeah, digital is very much the way we are moving forward, and I think that's for any any industry because you have to. 
uh, yes, we used to just say, can you just show my trailer on Facebook and then give you the two minutes, you know? But we realized it doesn't work. Nobody wants to watch exactly the same thing. So what these guys do is they curate content specifically for social media. I have done a 15-minute interview and I tell her, it's a great interview, take it. They come up with their own three-minute version. They don't use the five-minute version that I put on TV from the interview. So their version is different and then to hit you online so that when you watch it within those three minutes you get the entire sense of the interview which is what I do in five minutes. Same thing but different because of a different platform. And that's the whole idea. So we, we realize that we're reaching also different viewers. As you mentioned, traditional TV is a bit passe, different people watch it. Online everybody gets it on their phone. So they're not usually the same audience. We're finding that even though you see content online, you may not go and watch stuff on TV and vice versa. How long has television survived? That's oh, long enough for me to still have a job. I need about <laughs> 20 years. But I mean, talking so much about censorship um, and it being a deterrent to join the media, I don't think that if any of you are considering joining the media, that should be a reason for you to not join. Because, you know, you have to work, you, you, you have to want, you have to have people who want to push the boundaries. And maybe Min Min as a TV producer has faced different challenges, but I feel like at least in the digital space, people are becoming a lot more open-minded. So I had a colleague who, uh, who wrote an article about um, the medical facilities of construction workers and that went, you know, that got quite a bit of eyeballs um, online. And it's that desire to want to push boundaries that will eventually get something done, you know. So if, if, if you feel like you have a story to tell and you want to be one of these people to tell the stories, by all means come and do it. Don't let what you hear be a reason for you to not. Join the media. In, in, in fact, it's so important having people like Min because, again, a lot of the bosses, quite a few of them are old school in that sense. If there's no one telling them and saying, why can't we run this and fighting for that cause, they will keep on doing the same thing to every other producer who works for them. But if you can convince them otherwise to change their mind, then the next time somebody comes to say, can I do this? They're like, yeah, okay. Because the last time we did it, it, didn't, it actually worked out all right. So it is at the point there are levels of self-censorship, but that's the same with any way you go, any industry, your boss may say, no, we're not doing this, but you're like, why? Why can't I do this? Prove to him that it can be done and it can be done successfully. The next time, he'll let you do it. You guys all want to push boundaries. And you think that... No, I just want to have a job. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the... Those are the boundary pushers. I'm the old guy. And they are progressively changing it. Because yeah, maybe in part it has to do with the bosses who are the editors who are deciding whether your content goes on online or not. And the digital team, I'm glad to say that I don't think anyone's over the age of 40. <laughs> so everyone's pretty progressive. You know? uh, yeah, the digital team is. Uh... I would say they have more leeway to do things because even for our shows on TV, sometimes they get censored or we're told, you know, you can't put this, but they said, but when we said, okay, can we put it online? Then they said, okay, you can cut a short clip, you can include that particular shot that can't be shown on TV, it's gory or whatever, but online it's fine. Uh, even if, sorry. if you look at this morning's article, um, Josephine Teo, her uh, article on... on uh, wait, wait, what did you say? Know? Did you read the online version and the paid version? So that was the, the online headline, but when I opened up the streets, kind of something like, oh, how can young couples plan families? <laughs> I think it's, you know, <laughs> we really can't control the online conversation. I think as a result, uh, somehow the organization is giving us a lot more leeway to just uh, be bolder, I guess, online because the people are going to get the information anyway from other sources. So, on, uh, there's less restriction in online um, articles or or films. But then for TV, uh, I don't know for some reason because it, I guess it it really invades every home and it sometimes it's really mundane stuff. Like I did a show about sharks and sharks that were killed and they said you know we have to take out the shot the whole story was about the sharks you know and we had to take out the shots of the sharks 
and, and the reason was because uh, Deepavali is coming, we can't show all this before Deepavali. So I don't really understand, <laughs> understand the reasoning behind that. Um, or maybe there's the cultural well, Deepavali thing, and we are, I, I don't know. So it's a bit stricter just on TV, just because it, I think it really reaches out to everyone, the old and the young, and you can't really control because the three-year-old is going to turn on the TV and they're going to watch it. Also with CNA, we, uh, we broadcast to the region, so it's all about Asia, so sometimes we have to bear in mind that there are certain, sens as I mentioned earlier, certain sensitivities in different countries about showing certain things. Because what does that mean? It may mean that we get kicked out of the, we can't sh broadcast in their country, which means revenue loss, which means, so the world is cyclical. Hey, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, yeah no, sure. as you have another event. So it remains to thank you for this very informed discussion. Thanks to Tia, Shisha, and for their time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if you have more questions, you can find us all online. Just drop us a note and yeah, we'll happily chat with you online. As long as you're nice. <laughs> <laughs>